<laughs> we are finally sort of live. <laughs> Waiting for confirmation, but I think we're almost in. And then we lose DJ for a second. Yay. Awesome. All right. All right. Everybody, welcome to Thrive IT. This is going to be a very interesting day, not just because we started late because of some tech issues and we hope doesn't uh, uh, dog us midway through. But uh, if you're here, let us know in the comments so we can uh, welcome you properly. But uh, with me as always, Mr. Jeff Pitch. Hello, with a haircut, no hat today. I am <laughs> very happy about that. Michigan slowly opening up. Gotta love it. Yeah, yeah, nice. And then um, we have Ron Oglesby with us today. Yeah, how is, uh, you know, now that we've got the microphones, cameras, and YouTube working, <laughs> right? Takes three experts in technology to get a video going, I guess. Yeah, it's kind of strange. Actually, we did our part, just just for the record. We, we did our part. <laughs> just, uh, uh, but, you know, I opened up a trouble ticket, so... So we'll get there. <laughs> and then Jeff disappears. So, you know, there's that. that this so. is the way we roll. This is the way well, you know, we're rolling today. It was that red behind him, right? He, he painted his wall that red wings red. That, yeah, the cameras can't handle that, man. It can't handle that. You know, one of these days I do need to put up the um, the, the Steelers thing in the background here so I can actually feel like I fit in, you know, with the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah you got to yeah, just put a terrible towel up or something, you know, do yeah. a something there. Yeah. It's terrible, terrible. And there's Jeff. He's back. Welcome back, Jeff. Oh, no. Oh, His boy. audio is awful. Wow. Wow. Oh, my God. Where'd you put that microphone? Right up somewhere nasty. <laughs> This is like behind the scenes into what happens when tech geeks are like trying to do something. Right. And, you know, everyone that knows us that aren't technical people are like, oh, they just magically make everything work. It works the first time. It's awesome. And then yeah. if they could actually see this, they'd be like, you guys shouldn't be allowed to touch anything. Right. Yeah. It's like, seriously. Yeah. Well, actually, it's kind of funny. A lot of um, a lot of times I'll go into a, uh, a design scenario and I'll try to make it abundantly clear. It's just like, this is our best intention, mm -hmm. but it may not end up like this. And and then, you know, caveats after caveats after caveats, you know, and yeah, this is what design it's like. session, Design sessions are awesome, right? Yes, they are. <laughs> Here's, here is the great world we are going to build for you. Yes, Maybe. and it's going to be exactly like this and it will be perfect. <laughs> So how's my audio coming through now? Awesome there we now. Go. I don't know what you not, did with your mic before. Not, but not static and uh, well, actually. Be live like dropped me and then I like just connected and I had to like close browsers and all sorts of good stuff. Yeah, yeah. Technical godly gook. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I waved the magic wand. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're gonna trudge forward. I'm I'm sure we won't have probably quite as many people live today, but um, <laughs> Um, and I, I might just uh, start off the conversation and then just, you know, blast to Twitter that we're here. Um, if you are here with us and you're hearing us, maybe just announce to Twitter as well that uh, that we are actually live now, and and that'll be great. <laughs> that'll help us out a great deal. But anyway, yeah, we wanted to welcome Ron here with us today to uh, well, we're just going to talk about whatever we feel like it because that's how we roll around here. But um, yeah, yeah, so. Uh, Ron, give us a little bit of background about where you, uh, where you're coming from, where you're going, all that kind of stuff. So I was born in a small town in Illinois. No, um, yeah. So obviously, I'm. Uh, you know, the community knows me. I'm. I'm at the CTO's office, uh, EUC CTO's office at VMware right now, uh, kind of as a staff architect for Sean, uh, the CTO and VP on the EUC side. Uh, Jeff and I, uh, we work together for just a little bit. Uh, at Unidesk is just a little, uh, doing a little layering and file system and registry virtualization and beating our heads off of keyboards and stuff like that, you know? And, um, you know, folks that don't know my background, I, I grew up in EUC. I started on the Winframe days and was an EUC consultant and Citrix instructor and did all that stuff, uh, you know, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, 
2003 ish, right? I jumped into server virtualization, right? Did a lot of VMware, uh, ran a, a, was the senior guy at a consulting company for a while, uh, went to Dell as a practice exec for their, their data center operations and stuff like that. Uh, and then this guy named Don Bulens called me one day and said, hey, uh, we've got this stuff going on with desktops. Now imagine like I've had like four years where I haven't dealt with a desktop at all, right? I jumped into ESX and I was doing projects for companies like AMD and Ford and Pepsi, right? We're, we're redoing data centers in, in Malaysia and Japan and, and, you know, Denmark. We're just jumping everywhere, doing all these gigantic ESX designs. And this guy goes, hey, you should really come back to desktops. And I'm like, no, Ooh, I just don't know. Uh, but it was a great experience. It brought me back into EUC. And uh, I actually think my time uh, doing server virtualization and really being on that server-centric, storage-centric data center design actually helped as EUC really started to grow, right? I mean, it yeah. used to be, and Jeff remembers this, and I don't know how old you are, DJ. I got a lot of gray in my beard, you know. And, but it used to be that people were like, Hmm. Those folks, man, you don't know. They got a 2000 user server farm. You're like, damn, you know, I migrated. I helped migrate. Uh, I don't want to say I migrated because there was such a big team there. That was awesome. I helped migrate all state back in the day. They had all these disparate farms and we migrated them into one gigantic farm. And it was like 28,000 users at the time. And everyone's like, Oh my God, no one can ever build anything to host 28,000 users, you know? And we built it and it worked or 30,000. Nowadays, someone says 30,000. Yeah, it's a big farm, but it's yeah. like, <laughs> you're like, yeah, that happens. Yeah, okay. You know, not a big deal. But yeah. so it's been fun. It's been fun coming back to EUC and spending the last, God, 10 years now back in EUC. And I was at Citrix for a while and now I'm at VMware. And um, I don't know, I've seen all sides of it, it seems. Yeah, well, yes, I, mean, I think I, the, the, the big thing that, that you had that a lot of people didn't is you had that ESX deep experience when we started moving from physical, these servers mm -hmm. over to virtual and, you know, the whole performance and how many mm -hmm. users it's takes a nosedive. But, you know, <laughs> just I crap. remember I remember there was a and it was iPhone. It was before uh -huh. Citrix converted to Synergy. Yep. Rick Dellinger was up there with a guy from like CCS talking about, you know, at the time it was like Metaframe, right? Or presentation server on ESX, right? And they were doing all this stuff. And I was like, that's stupid. Get out of there. Just, <laughs> that's bad. Um, <laughs> that, that was that practical consultant. I work in an office every day and I'm dealing with problems not looking forward, right? Like I had to actually learn to look forward. And, uh, you know, I was the guy at Bryform at one of the first Bryforms. I, I think it was called, the presentation was called uh, like Windows XP on ESX. We didn't even call it VDI at the time. And it started because one of my customers hated their Citrix environment so bad that even though we were like, well, you can fix this. Wait a minute, you've got these issues. Let's, let's address the issues. And they're like, no, 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 just burn it all down. Mm -hmm. And their idea was when there was no brokers, there was nothing. They were like, we're just going to put a bunch of Windows XP on those ESX servers you built for our data center and just build us some more servers. And I'm like, no, this is a bad idea. Don't do that. <laughs> and from a purely logical at the time, how many sessions can I get? What's my, I was building them DL 585s, right? Those aren't cheap servers. Right. Back in the day, yeah. DL585s, you know, back then it was 32 gig of RAM, right? Everyone was freaked out because it had 32 gig of RAM. But I was like, no, you're only going to get like 20 instances. And I could build a Metaframe server and get, you know, 60 on it. Don't do that. And they're like, no, you're you're out of your mind. Get out of here. And, you know, I went to Bryform and just did performance analysis. And I'm like, look, your sessions, here's your sessions. Here's the number of users you can get. Here's cost per session. And um, man, it's all changed, ain't it? Hey, yeah. everybody move to cloud, right? It's all changed now. Well, it's and it's like, virtual yeah. now. I mean, it's, it, you know, it's, it is amazing how much the hypervisors have changed to be able to handle sure. those loads. 
yeah. I mean, because you're right. I mean, it, there was I, when it first began, I swear it was like if you got 15 users on a session host, MetaFrame, whatever, you were like a yeah. god at the time. Yeah. Yeah. You know, now it's like if you're only getting 15, <laughs> you're, you you're know, like, what you're apps doing? are you running? Yeah. Right? You're like, <laughs> what is on that server? I mean, it, it's yeah, things have changed. And, you know, back in the day, people didn't understand even. And, and it's it's part of our problem as IT folks. Um, we'll run up a, a load and we'll go, well, my performance sucks. And if we don't understand, if we actually don't deep dive and understand why performance sucks, we just yeah. go, oh, well, th we just can't do it. That performance sucks. And right. uh, there's no greater example of this than the original VDI workloads and disk I.O. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. People looked at server load which is heavy, heavy read in most cases, mm -hmm. it's fine. And they started to extrapolate from their ESX environments and the storage requirements there from an IO perspective and a bandwidth perspective. And VDI, the second you put a desktop on there and it starts paging and people start writing to the school location for printing and all these random writes. And they're like, my storage is crashing. We're like, yeah, storage is crashing. That's bad. <laughs> we should stop that, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. I, let's I, I, I know people have argued me, argued with me on this, but I, I I do truly believe that Nutanix coming along or that hyper converged technology saved VDI. I, I mean, because it was so expensive to put it on yeah. a normal SAN, like you're saying, to get those IOPS, you had to have like 50 disks in in whatever they call it, the caddies or whatever, you know, spread the load across and it was like ridiculously. And us and we we us in IT, we cause that because what happens is let's say you're at company X and you've built an ESX environment and you're happy and you're on vSphere 4 or something and everything's awesome. And you've got all this storage and you've got a design, DJ and I were just saying, we've got this design, we're gonna follow through with it. And all someone introduces this new workload of desktops and they go, take our design and copy it. Not thinking about requirements, not thinking about actual workload. And then they go, wait a minute, do I really need mirrored RAID sets that are replicated at the volume level <laughs> to other storage arrays, both in the data center and at our replica site for a desktop, right? But they don't think like that. They just, they do, they do it and, and it's completely wrong. And you're right, not just Nutanix, but the whole concept of caching right IO or moving it to the fast disk and the idea of internalized tiered storage um, I think I did a, it's probably still on YouTube. I did a video once for Nutanix. I was at like a VM world or something for Unidesk and they're like, Ron, come in. And they had this whole professional studio. They said, I'm like in a black t-shirt, right? <laughs> and they sit me down and they're like, just asking me questions about Nutanix. And I remember somebody else had told me this saying, and it just stuck with me. They're like, well, why do you like Nutanix? And I go, it's, it's about simplicity. And so many times I'm trying to sell someone Unidesk, this little bit of software, yet I have to help them build a house to sell them the paint. I got to right. tell them about their storage, their servers, their network yeah. bandwidth, their thin clients, uh, profile. You know, I just I, I just want to sell this paint. It's yeah. it's beige. It's awesome, right? Yeah. You know? Yeah, and that in 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 yeah, that was one of the great things about Unidesk is. Well, we had Gunther in support who knew not just Unidesk, but VMware, Windows, I mean, all this stuff to be able to do that. And I know even for myself, it was a crash course in a lot of new technology that I had, not new technology, but for me, having to learn the ins and outs much more than what I had before, like you which said, is, just which is awesome, Unidesk. Right, which, is, which was awesome. We had... Uh... I remember when vSAN first came out and uh, everybody was hyped on vSAN, right? Woo, bow down. And if you remember vSAN 1.0, they still use the same type of replication model for their individual disks, but they had this component limit where you could only have so many disks. Yeah. And you were like, well, if I'm doing server vert, that's easy. But if I'm doing desktop vert where I attach multiple disks like layers, 
they didn't count a disc as one replica or something. They would actually say, oh, 50 desktops connected to this one disc. That's 50. Yeah. And so, like, dude, discs wouldn't attach. Things were crashing. <laughs> Ron's, I'm, I'm making spreadsheet calculators to tell people, okay, if you got one operating system layer and 11 application layers, you get this many desktops. And, yeah, it's, you learn a lot. When you're out at a vendor, you learn a lot just trying to fill holes to get your product to work on somebody else's product. Yeah. yeah, just adapting in general is something that's kind of a, well, you know, actually we're going to talk about soft skills and that sort of thing. And that's, yeah. that's actually one of them that I, I find a lot of people truly struggle with is like, okay, no, I do it this way. And, mm -hmm. you know, they, they can't like get in their heads that there's another way to do something or they need to change the way they do things, which that's human and, nature. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and it's amazing to me. And I, I know I've said this before, but we work in a sea of change technology. Mm -hmm. We work in a sea of change, but I don't know a more set in stone group of people, myself included, that when these changes happen, we're like, no, I, it works, man. I, I'm not changing this. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. we don't accept it, but yet our whole life, our whole career is based on this change, constant yeah. change. Yeah. Yeah, there, there's, you know, there's something to be said for, you know, if it's if it's not broke, don't fix it. Um, and and a lot of times when we look at IT folks, one of the things they're trying to do is, look, I already have a lot to do, and I'm fixing this and I'm dealing with that, and you're telling me to change something that happens to be working. That I understand it. Right. I understand why they don't want to do it. They don't want to be there at, at eight o'clock tonight, rebooting some machine and, and resetting up some service differently. But again, human nature, it's a little short sighted. Right. What they're not seeing is if I stay three hours tonight, next week, it saves me 28 minutes. Right. And yeah, 28 minutes doesn't sound a lot next week, but a week over week over week, all of a sudden they're not staying there at eight o'clock at night because they made these changes. The other thing we have is this institutional momentum. We've always done it this way. Right. You see that in migration. Someone going, let's let's use the EUC as an example. Um, but hell, we could use server virtualization if we wanted. Someone going from, you know, VMware to Citrix or Citrix to VMware. All they want to do is forklift an image. Let me just lift this image up and move it over here. They don't look at what they've done to the image, why it's set up that way. Was it set up for a specific provisioning model? Um, and does it set me up for better in the future? They just want to forklift. And we used to see this in the server virtualization space. People used to be like, no, just P to V it. Just, just move it from there to this virtual thing that you made but I don't want to change anything else. And you're like, wait a minute, you can do backups differently. You can do your DR. No, we don't want to change anything else. We have all these other plans. And you're like, well, that'll save you money. Well, we'll look at that later. It's human nature, right? Yeah. But it's also, if we apply those lessons that we learned in server to EUC, especially with all the EUC, you know, is all front of mind these days. Yeah. We can start to say, look, it's not about migrating. It's not about changing platform. It's about starting to say, what's the best way to do this for three years from now? And kind of a transformation, not a migration. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it's yeah. it's that it's it 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 it's also the that attitude that reason why you know hospitals and, and businesses still have software that requires XP or even Windows 2000, you know, that type of thing, because they don't want to change it. And then now they have to change it, but yeah. they don't, you know, it's too late. And so they're scrambling to find new solutions and it just, it gets crazy. They're still using Unix print tables on the back end. And, you <laughs> sure. know, those of us in the UC, we all know the WFC client name and how that variable is passed up and, you know, in a Citrix session and, and, oh, well, you're located here. I parsed your name, here's your table. And it, you're like, really? Can we figure out a better way to do this, right? I was doing this in 1999, right? There was a dot matrix. Da, 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 da. There was a dot matrix printer when we started this. Let's stop it. 
you know. <laughs> I'm still waiting for the paperless office from IBM. So yeah. I think that was 80s around. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you yeah. what, I get laughed at at VMware sometimes because I'll be on a phone call. I've been trying to learn and consume things. And I'm that guy with a notebook. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. I literally flip pages in the middle of a meeting. They hear it. They're like, who's turning pages? <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of crazy how that goes, but that's something that um, when I got back into consulting in the field, that was a weird adjustment for me because I I was like the one note guy and, and I yeah. still am like very much like I'm just bam, 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 bam. but I actually found that uh, when it comes to customers, they actually had more respect and, and more attentiveness when I was writing things down mm. with a pen rather than with a... A computer because they didn't know if I was just checking my email or if I was part of the conversation. You got that screen right there. Yeah. They don't know. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Well, and that's, and that's because they know what they do, right? A lot of times we, we project on someone else. Let's, let's, let's say, and I, you know, I did a bunch of those design sessions, DJ. And, you know, if I had a screen up, what they really think is if they open their laptop, the first thing they're going to do is check email. They're going to go to their message board. They're going to see if there's anything. And so if they see you open a screen, a customer sees you open a screen, they project that. Yep. that my experience is when you open a screen, you do this. Therefore, you're doing it. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're completely disconnected and you're one noting away, that they don't care. Right? And that's part of that human nature, one of those soft skills of understanding. It, it's like that much of all these human behaviors when you're trying to be a good consultant, you're trying to be yeah. a leader or whatever, that if you understand that, you can start to go, well, yeah, I like my OneNote. I use OneNote all the time. But I've went to paper and I've stayed with paper just because people get it. And when I when people hear me flip that page and I go, hold on, hold on, hold on, I'm taking notes, say that again. Yep. The feeling they get, it's a human thing. They're like, oh, this dude really, really thinks what I'm saying is important. Even if 20 minutes later, and we've all done this as consultants, you go, okay, here's what you said you wanted to do. That's probably not good, right? Because they saw you pay attention, they'll listen to your answer. You know, it's ah, it's a big thing, man. It's a big thing. Yeah, and it's weird that we don't teach this. Not no. really. I mean, we don't we don't we don't uh, kind of make that community knowledge. We don't make this known that it's like, look, these are the kind of things that are actually putting me forward of other other people. It's not not that I just you know am uh, prettier. It's not that at all. <laughs> You're a pretty man, DJ. <laughs> you got the hair, brother. Why I'm here, hair. man. <laughs> but it is important to know that it's not just about like technical skills. You know, yeah. it it really is just embracing a lot more, you know, usable methodology and these these little things really make a huge difference in in how we do things. So I'm curious what other soft skills you can think of that that people don't always think of that have made it like a, just a huge yeah. come forward in your life. Well, you know, it's interesting that we're doing, you know, because of COVID and we're at the end of it and we're doing all this remotely and all that. We're, you know, I always like to call us big monkeys, right? We're all still big monkeys, right? We've got this yeah. little part of the brain way back here that every now and then triggers. And one of the things that, that I've realized is that I generally don't learn from books. I really learn from people. Right. I, I can read a I can read a, a, a page on how some function is supposed to work and I go, OK, I just learned that. But when you're talking about really learning and being efficient and being um, uh, uh, an influencer, right, an influencer is terrible because now people think about Instagrams and butt selfies or whatever. But I really mean influencing those in the rooms to follow uh, some uh, uh, dream you have. I, you learn that from people. We learn that from connections yeah. with people. We look in each other's eyes. We we do it. And you know, I I lucked out, right? I, I really did. I lucked out uh, in my first real consulting gig that I wound up with some guys that really taught me. You know, uh, Jeff knows a guy that I then hired later at Unidesk named Rob Zalowski. Um, my first design session, we were doing this big design session, and I, I was good at what I did. I was a technical guy. 
but I made faces, right? Someone would say something completely useless in the room and I'd be like, <laughs> and I do that or I'd squint my eyes. I just oh, made, yeah. I didn't say anything to them, but I made faces, but right? I, I was 29 years old. I was, you know, I thought I was smarter than everybody. <laughs> and I'd make faces and he, he started kicking me. We'd be at a table and he kicked me under the table. And they tell me at lunch, he's like, stop it. Dude, just don't make any faces. Just, but it was learning that personal interaction that, you know, I kind of came from that muscled up ex military cop world where you're like, everything is aggressive and all that. And making faces at anyone that said anything stupid was exactly what you were supposed to. What'd you just say? Yeah. That doesn't make any sense. But he taught me to go, look, you think it's stupid. They think it's the most important thing in the world. Yep. Maybe it is. You don't know unless you're literally willing to listen to them. And yeah, the, the biggest the biggest thing was listening. And, and it's funny. Uh, when I came to VMware and I was on the phone with, you know, the VP who's in charge of EUC sales, the, the guys who run competitive work, the, you know, all this stuff. They're like, oh, what do you think about this? And I'm like, well, I can't say yet. And I just kept saying that and I got asked why. And I said, look, I don't know why you're doing what you're doing yet. And until I understand that, how can I criticize it? Well, what about this? And I go, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I got my own way and I have ideas, but you know, one of the things that we in IT really have to do is if you become a person who is at least willing to understand what that customer, what that consumer of the product is trying to tell you, even if they're telling you something that's awful, mm -hmm. right? People want to hear good news. No, I want to talk to the guy who says, that's the worst thing I've ever seen in my entire life. Stop doing that. And you got to sit there and take it, right? <laughs> then you can at least start to, okay, they're wrong on a little bit, but they're right on a lot. Let's go fix that. And well, that's and a great soft skill. Yeah. And I, and I think sometimes it's, it's even, I mean, I know I've been in situations where, yeah, I hear somebody and and they've got this really dumb process or, you know, whatever it is. And I'm thinking in my head, oh, my God, we got to get this fixed. But you ask, why are you doing it that way? You know, what's the reason? Is there, you know, and then they tell you and you're like, oh, OK, I get it. Now. I understand. It still may be a bad idea. It still may not be the best, but at least now you've got the insight exactly. to be able to, to then hopefully maybe direct them or, or you need to change what your plan is, your yep. solution to fit within that. It may I'll, be legitimate I'll, reasons. I'll give you a great example. Um, it's funny, Mark Lockwood, who is at Gartner now, used to be at a, a company, Eli Lilly out of Indiana, big pharmaceutical company. And we went in and did a design for them for ESX. And, Lockwood is a smart dude, right? He had figured out a lot of this stuff beforehand, but he needed people to, to help him back it up, right? So we did financial models. We did designs with them, all this stuff. Their network model at the time was so, to me, foreign and asinine. I had a DL-585. I almost filled up every slot in the back of that thing with four NIC, NIC cards. I mean, imagine, but there was like, there was like, 12 or 16 NICs in this ESX server. Wow. <laughs> but the reason we did it was because we needed buy-in from their security team. Yep. Who, at the, yeah, who at the time... I, my mind. I was like, this is security all over. Who at, yeah, who at the time was not segregating via VLAN, right? They were actually segregating via physical network. Um, you know, we needed buy-in from their PCI compliance team. We needed buy-in from government regulators who believe that you know, if you happen to patch Windows, sometime, somehow math stops working on that computer or something or changes. Right. But, you know, he said something at the time that was cool. We were designing it, and literally we had these images of 585s with color-coded NICs and where we were going to route them to in the network. And he goes, all we have to do is get it in place. And as they grow, this will grow. And we can simplify it and change it. And I'm like, all right, cool. Cool. I'll build, I'll build an ESX server with 20 NICs. Let's just go do it, right? Whatever. You know, and, and you're right, Jeff. You just have to ask that question. You know, the other thing is, especially for younger folks, you got to be who you are. 
You know, I, I for all the times that Rob kicked me under the table and said, yeah. stop making faces, you know, yeah, you can learn soft skills to be a better person, a better human being, a better listener. Um, but you also have to be who you are, right? Some yeah. guys are, are, they're not the person that is going to stand at the front of the room with 28 people and ask hard questions. They have them in their head, but they're the person that passes the note to the other guy that'll ask the hard question. Yeah. And they're geniuses. They'll go write whatever you need them to write and they're great. But um, you got to be who you are also. And um, Jeff and I were, were talking the other day and I, I told this story about how um, I'd learned to be a consultant. I'd learned to run these big design sessions, right? I was top of the world. I was running around. I was like, ah, oh, I'm 30 years old. I know everything. I've, I've, I've killed it. Um, but what I saw was all the customers I went to, all the guys in charge were wearing, wearing way different clothes than I did. Right. I was in, like, at best, I was in khakis and a black polo, right. With my arms too big and my tattoos showing. And I thought, you know, if I want to get up to the top, I, I got to start dressing like it. I got to start acting like it. And I literally went out and like, I bought a but bunch of button down long sleeve shirts. I bought nice pants, right? I was that dude. I had nice shoes. And after like six or seven months, I just, I'm like, okay, this isn't resonating. It's, it's not play. I, what I did was I took a weakness of mine, which happens to be a tattooed motor motorcycle riding fisherman guy. And I thought it was such a weakness that I had to cover it up that I had yeah. to change. And I forgot a lesson where someone said, look, hide your weaknesses, play to your strengths. And a lot of people think that you should work on your weaknesses. And yeah, you look, don't be an ass, right? Don't be a jerk to people, right. you know. But once you've level set that you're a human being and you're a good person and you listen to people, dude, if you're a guy with tattoos down to your arm, you're guys with tattoos down to your wrist. If, if yep. you're the person that's quiet in a meeting, cool. Be the coolest quiet person ever. <laughs> If you're the guy who's loud, like Ron, fine, be the loud guy, right? And and uh, once I stopped doing that, it, I got happier. And B, it really turned into my speaking persona change. I was able to go on stage and talk yep. and not try to be the stiff guy, right? <laughs> Dude, you're getting Adele, you know? And I'm walking, you know, I, I turned into a real person that people go, yo, man, I saw this dude. He was wearing a Harley t-shirt but he was talking about processor virtualization and core scheduling on ESX and it was freaking awesome. Yeah. Play to that, you know, play to that, play to that weirdness. It's okay. <laughs> so let me ask uh, you this, Ron. About, I, I have no clue what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> so it was now Ron Bry form, the first Bry form. Yep. You and I remember well, I'm sure. Uh, was that the first time you went on stage with a beer? Because that kind of became a signature for you. Yeah. Oh man. Well, if you remember the first Bry Forum, they had no alcohol license at that place, and you weren't allowed to drink in the place. And, well, to me, that was just wrong. I like <laughs> it. Um, and it happened with uh, Jeroen, uh, who at the time was at, at Login Consultants, right? It became Login BSI and all that stuff. And I, they gave me this gigantic room, and I want to say it was like ESX versus Zen Server. I was doing some type of storage performance analysis or something. Right. Yeah, okay. And I'm standing on stage, and they're like, I'm like, look, this would have been a lot more fun with some beer. And everyone laughed, and I just kind of went on my way. But as soon as I said that, your room, who's like 6'9", right? You can't miss this guy. He gets up, and he runs out the door. And I'm like, well, I already pissed him off. And I put in my slides. Like 10 minutes later, he comes running back in. And he's got a sixer of Heineken. <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah, and he, he like ran down the street to a liquor store and comes up on stage and sets it. And I gave him one and I took one and we all had a big laugh. And then it became this thing at Bry Forum that Ryan yeah. showed up with a beer, you know. And, uh, you know, I don't need a beer to get through a session. But I do enjoy a beer, you know what I mean? Yeah, I think of like um... – well, I mean, in a host of different things, different examples. I mean, um, I mean, our our, our friend Dan Allen, 
Yeah. I had his signature shirt. It's like always the ACDC shirt, right? It's like, it's his, his signature. And it was like half rebellion, half like just what you're saying about just be who you are. It's important. You know, if you're, yeah. <laughs> if you're not going to be, uh, well, and I, I went through the same thing. And, and there's times where I was like, look, I need to, you know, the clothes maketh man is the whole thing. And, and I've, I noticed differences when I put on a, a, a a button down shirt or a suit, even like working here at home, there's been times where I've like, okay, th there's like a, a signal with that. <laughs> but if it's not you, then don't. You but know? it's a signal. You just said it. It's a signal. Yeah. And right. so it's it's great. Like when I was at Dell, I was all over the world, right? I would, I, they were flying me everywhere. When I was in Japan, I wore a suit because, and well, I did actually didn't own suits. So I had a sport jacket and a tie and, and, work pants, you know, um, but to show up there, you know, this is that understanding and listening to other people. If I didn't show up with a tie, I wasn't there to work. And the customer would feel insulted that I, you know, wasn't there to work. Yeah, now yeah. I was in Australia, right? Completely. Yes, they still dress nice in Australia, but you know, <laughs> the people that met me at, at, when I first got to the, the office, you know, I'd been flying for like 20 something hours at that point. I had a beard and, and I'm like, oh man, I just need a shower and a beard. And the girl literally, I'll never forget. She was at the front desk. She goes, well, we have a room over there for you. You can go over there, take a nap, shower. We have a room for that. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. Um, your guy. And I'm like, I didn't know I had a guy. She goes, your guy gets here at nine. Um, he knows where the beer is. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, cool. All right. You know, and, and all, all of a sudden it's, oh, okay. I, I don't have to wear a tie here. I, you have to understand signals and, and start to interact with people. And I, I think that you can be an awesome IT person. And I've met a lot of great, brilliant IT people in my life. But if you don't empathize, if you can't talk to people, if you can't yeah. pick up on their signals and go, Today I'm putting on a collar. I'm gonna put the collar. I put a collar on for you guys, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was wondering why you did that. This is kind yeah, of shocking. Actually, me. I was like, wow. actually, I, I have a call right after this. That I need <laughs> there for. it is. There it is. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, if you don't empathize and you and you don't pick up on signals, which let's face it, a lot of great IT folks, they're they're not. The reason they're great at IT is because they're great at numbers and algorithms and math and and <laughs> this this string logical thought that doesn't make them awesome. Hey, I can I can walk around the room and everybody knows who I am and I've shook everybody. They're not great at that type of interaction. Yeah, and that's that's another key too. Here is that you know, and like uh, Brett mentioned that um, uh, Dan Feller comes to mind as well. Same kind of same kind of thing, and that's what I've you know appreciated too is of uh, uh, people that just can dress as they are and not and for for dan i'm sure it's um a comfort thing as much as anything uh is like being in front of people can be intimidating too and so yeah. this is like um it's almost like putting on a a uh a uniform or a costume yeah. you know which is when i was uh a dj that was the thing, you know, I, I put on the, like the tux shirt and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and there was a persona that I was putting on and that was important. And I addressed things, you know, get it in a microphone physically in my hand. And I talk differently. You know, yep. I do, I, I, I address things with, with more gusto and I'm much more high energy, like end of the night, I'm done. Right. Yeah. Same kind of thing with, with it is you've got to realize that the people have these little quirks and things that they have. Uh, quirks and features <laughs> we're on youtube i can say that right <laughs> but honestly i think really what the the thing about this is important is to realize that you it's not like an instantaneous kind of thing you didn't start in it and next thing you're on stage yeah. so these are little things you have to develop along the way to make sure that you are living in the kind of uh, way you want to and, and yeah. what's comfortable for you. And like you said earlier, like not everybody's going to be that guy that's going to get in no. front of the room and address everybody. You know, I remember lots of times in consulting, like training junior consultants and things like that. I would always say like, look, get on messenger and, and send me a message. If you, something comes up and you're not comfortable asking, just let me know we're here yeah. as a team yep. and that's perfectly okay you know it's it's perfectly okay not to be the person that's gonna be up on stage presenting that's 
perfectly yeah. fine. Yeah. But live within your strengths because you're living in your strengths, not because you feel like it's a suit you need to put on every day. The other the other thing is that, and and I'm not going to knock CTPs or V experts or anything like that, but a lot of times people equate success in IT with speaking on a stage or, you know, being prominent somehow. Um, yeah. You know, I've, I've met guys that are like unsung heroes in IT. Some of them are in corporate environments, like, you know, big environments at Ford or Exxon or whatever. Um, and they've been a, they're an architect there. They've architected these gigantic environments. Nobody knows their name. Yeah. You know, I used to use this, um, my daughter, used to bring me to school all the time when they had those career days, right? And you'd bring a little PowerPoint. And one of the things I'd do is I had a photo of Mark Zuckerberg, and then I had a photo of the guy at the time who was the VP of infrastructure for Facebook. And I'd be like, everybody know who this is? And they're like, oh, yeah, Facebook. You know, like anybody uses Facebook now, but back in the day, right? Yeah. <laughs> and then I'd flip to the next slide, and i go, who's that? And the room would go silent. And I go, that's the guy who makes sure that every time you type in facebook.com, it connects and it's fast and it works. And nobody knows his name. And then back at, back then, I remember one of them, remember, remember when Angry Birds was big? <laughs> I, I had an Angry Birds slide and I'm like, everyone thinks Angry Birds is cool. No one understands that it's sitting on a server there's wires connecting that server. There's power connecting that server. And there are all these really brilliant people. You know, there's, there's a guy named Clark. I'm not going to throw his last name out there just because I don't, I didn't tell him I was going to talk about him. But <laughs> there's a guy named Clark at Microsoft that has been there forever. And I worked with him years ago on a design for Microsoft to do some RDS, what was at the time terminal services, now RDS in India and for their ISPs and different things. And this guy has been behind the scenes at Microsoft for like 20 years, helping to push RDS, push terminal services, get features, move it to Azure. No one knows this guy's name. You know what I mean? He's been on stage a yeah. few times, but there are a lot of, you know, you can be successful in IT and someone might not know your name. You know what I mean? It's, it's like yeah. anything else. I, you know, uh, and, we're all loudmouths and we go out and we talk. <laughs> um, but other than that, but that, that doesn't mean successful. I've known guys that stood right. up on stage and they were rockheads. You know, I mean, don't gauge this as success, I guess. And honestly, I think a lot of people that are up on stage sometimes are better at talking than they, than they are at listening. And that's mm -hmm. actually a detriment. And yeah, like you're saying, I think a lot of times people are equating that, oh, they're up on stage. That means they made it. No, it means that a lot of times they're just really good BS artists. It 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 actually <laughs> see. Yeah, I mean, and, and it is something that you have to enjoy doing, right? I mean, yeah. you know, it's but it yeah, you're right. It doesn't mean you are any more qualified than the guy down the street to be talking okay. about what you're talking about. You know, it's, and that's and that's a great point to to remember if you want to be a speaker, if you want to stand in the front of the room. Those people sitting down in front of you, they're just as freaking smart as you are. And there's probably someone in the audience that's smarter. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> I've, I've met folks through my career, guys who had PhDs. I met Stuart, the guy who invented softricity, right? Like a dual PhD from yeah. MIT, freaking genius, right? Yeah. We didn't even talk tech. We sat around and got a little loaded and talked baseball, you know, but... I saw him in one of my sessions, or Benny Trish, right, Dr. Benny Trish. And I saw him in one of my sessions, and the first time I met him, he's like, oh, man, I can't believe this is awesome, blah, blah, blah. And I figured out, oh, this dude's like a PhD in computer science genius, and he is. He's just a brilliant man. Yeah. I'm like, oh, I can't even believe he likes my shit. I'm, oh, <laughs> yeah, really? man, I can't yeah. even believe it. Yeah. Honestly, I'm feeling the same way lately. It's yeah. really kind of crazy. Like I, I, But it is one of those things where I realize that this is a strength and I need to live within this strength. You know, if I'm going to be the cheerleader, I'll be the cheerleader, you know, and I, I spent years behind the scenes, you know, not wanting to take the spotlight. And, and it's only when I've realized that no, actually my, my strength is that, you know, lots of us can do the technology. And if I can hold these people up and, and bring them 
further up in their confidence, then we all win. Yeah. And you know, if you don't, if you don't make your presentations, assuming that people in the audience know everything you're saying and can pick it apart, then you're, you're making a weak presentation. Whenever I make something, I always think the guy who wrote that code might be in the audience. I better know what I'm about to say about how it accesses the disc or how it does whatever, because, you know, you don't just want to give out false information. You want to make sure you're right on every point and you can have opinions. You can say, this is stupid. You shouldn't do this, but, and you can have an argument with someone, but if you're not at least informed and assume that they know more than you, you shouldn't even be on stage. Shouldn't even be on stage. It's true. Yeah. One of the things um, I was listening to uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson, Neil deGrasse Tyson speak about how he prepares. And if I remember correctly, he was saying that, you know, for a one hour speech, no matter what it is, commencement on TV, you know, whatever it might be, he spends about 10 times the amount on getting prepared for that. And you know, and that's kind of the secret of his success of why pe- everybody thinks this is this brilliant guy that knows everything. And he is brilliant, but he doesn't yeah. know everything. He doesn't it's just, know- yeah, it's just not flowing out of the back of some bucket somewhere. He he thinks yeah. about it. He yeah. unpacks it. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, that's very well, true. I know we only got like two minutes left because if yeah. I don't get on a call with a customer, I, you know. <laughs> Uh, somebody sends a paycheck. If they're oh, in Palo sure. Alto, a paycheck comes. But you get a paycheck? Uh, yeah, it's awesome. Dude, you should try it. No, 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 no. You get an actual paycheck? No, no. I get a, I get a, I get a picture on my email that says, yeah, you got paid. <laughs> oh, okay, great. You know. Um, but, you know, be yourself. And remember, we are not the smartest people in the room. You know, and, and. It's a fine line. You have to have confidence in your knowledge, but on the flip side, you have to go, there's somebody in here that can pick apart everything I'm saying, you know? And if you do that, yeah, you'll wind up pretty good. Yeah. Well, Ron, thanks for being with us. Oh yeah. I hit the wrong (laughs) button there. Let's try that again. Thanks for being with us. (laughs) And uh, we definitely wish you well. We'll, we'll probably stick around and, and uh, take any questions, but we know you got to go. Uh, but yeah, thanks for being with us, and uh, we'll have to do this again soon. Dude, I loved it. I appreciate yeah. it, guys. Thanks for having me on. Thank All you, right. Ryan. I appreciate it. I'll Cheers, talk man. to you later. Bye. Bye. <clears throat> All right. Well, that was Ron Oglesby, the man. <laughs> <laughs> the myth, the legend. The man, the myth, the legend. That's right. You know, it's funny. I used to, I, I have a background in, actually, my first background was in psychology. And I, I think what he was saying about uh, not making faces and, and things like that is, is something I took for granted. I didn't, I don't always put that together that it's like, yeah, I, I, I am even keeled in my responses. My wife actually pointed this out the other day that, you know, you just don't respond to things. You don't, I mean, not that you don't respond. It's more like you don't. You, you put on a poker shot. face. Yeah, it is kind of a, a poker face. But the difference is when you're when you're learning that you need to be doing so with empathy. I yeah. see some people out there, you know, consultants and whatnot that, that go out in the field and they're just so hell bent on their way, you know, that they, yep. they have it figured out already, you know, that they already have the answers. And uh, you mentioned, I think, uh, you know, situations where, well, yeah, there's other things that you haven't considered over here. And there's some things that may not be the best solution, but honestly, it's, it's what's going to work in this kind of scenario. And you have to be open to that. And if you're not, and, and, you know, and, and you and Ron were talking about, you know, solution designs at the top. If you're not asking those questions to understand why their processes are what they are, you know, when I'm doing discovery, I try to under, you know, it, it's, I try to get a, a whole picture, not just the part that I need to focus on. You know, if, whether it's setting up a Citrix or a VMware environment or whatever, I want to know as much as I can that's going around it because there are times where those what would be considered external factors come into play when developing those designs. 
Yeah. And if you don't know about them and you put forth a proposal, you know, they're going to say, oh, well, this, this, and this, and you're going to, oh, shoot, got to go back and redo it and all that stuff. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's listening and, and, I mean, listening is obviously I, is, is just a huge portion of what a lot of us miss doing. Um, and sure. like, like you just said, don't make the assumption that the best practice is the best practice for every company or you know process in the world, whatever it may be. Um, there are legitimate reasons to break out to you know, not use best practices, mm -hmm. and yeah, you have to understand the whys. You know, you got to find out. Yeah, you don't agree with it, but if you if you don't know why they're doing it, how are you going to dispute it? You know, how are you going to argue again? Not argue, but you know, yeah. argue against it yeah. and and try to change their minds. Actually, this has been something that's really been key for me too, and this is a a turning point in my consulting career. Actually, this is something that. Um, I just got done editing uh, the, the third section of my book, and it's something where you have to understand that people don't want to change a lot of the time. They, they, they actually want things to stay in a steady state, and if you are there in a position that you're recognizing that things have to change, that you have to do something different, then it becomes critical to have a good approach to presenting that. And what I found, and this is something I don't credit myself with this at all. This is something that, that I got um, out of a lot of pain in my early consulting career with, with Citrix is that I would put the solution out there and they were like, don't do that. And I was like, well, what do you do? And it became what I call the, the magic paragraph. And, and I'm, I'm going to give, uh, give you your, your, your value for listening today right here. <laughs> the the magic paragraph is you state what they're doing, state why that's bad, state what they should do differently, and then state what to do to get there. It's simple. It's a good approach. But the thing is, you're starting with what the reason they're doing something. And you're stating, okay, you know, you're doing this today this is what you actually want to accomplish and here's why that's not working you know this is what is wrong with this and you're you're making a solid case but you're not wishy-washy about well i think it should be this way you're not saying right. you're saying you're telling me it shouldn't be this way you know we've had this conversation already we've already had this this listening session where you told me all your goals and now i have this in front of me and saying this is not meeting your goals here's what you should do differently and that catapulted my consulting career, absolutely just getting that into my head of how to approach this. It wasn't what I know about technology. I mean, for crying out loud, how many blogs do we have out there? And I'm like, that. there's plenty of people that know stuff. It really is embracing those kind of out of the box thinking as far as that goes, but it's really just at its core, it's just caring enough to actually listen. And then, well, yeah. You know, and yeah. it shouldn't be out of the box thinking to, to, to listen to what somebody is telling you. Um, I, you know, one of the most frustrating things I, I find is if I'm working with someone in sales, the customer goes through their whole thing. And then like five minutes later, you know, the sales guy asks a question that was, they had one already answered and told, you know, so now he, he we look not, not good because he was yeah. not, you know, or he or she was not listening. And it's like, I just makes me want to pull my hair out. Like, oh, right. come on. Yeah. But and yeah, if, if you don't listen, how are you going to, you know, rebut it or, and you know, anything? Because you have no basis at that point other than, I think it needs to be done this way, or the documentation says it. Needs, well, you know what? Yeah, <laughs> that's 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 another one where I, I see a lot of the people saying that they just want to go in, and when they say they're doing an assessment, what they're actually doing is running a script and gathering everything about the environment, and yeah, thinking that that's somehow going to tell them what they need to know. And don't get me wrong; it's an important part of the process. But if that's your whole process, you're going to be wrong. You are yeah. going to be wrong, period. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. 
because all, I mean, you're, you're getting part of the you're, you're getting part of the discovery, but you're right. You know, it, it's not going to sh magically show you an answer. You know, is it running right? Is it not running right? You know, I mean, I think um, um, was it you during E two E um, or or maybe it was somebody else, but they were talking about. No, it, uh, I can't pronounce his name, but you and I were talking about him the other day. Uh, and I'm face e Egypt, Egypt. Sorry, I don't know. I'm sure I got it wrong. But they were the Go EUC guys. We're talking. Oh yeah, about yeah, okay, owners. sure. In that I can look at my monitoring software and everything can look good, but if you don't go out to the end user and see what they're seeing. Those bat, those stats that you've got don't mean anything because they could still be having issues that are not being translated through the monitoring software for whatever reason. So you you got to be able to look beyond the numbers and really work with the people. And I and it's hard. And I know it's really hard when you're young because I was the yeah. same way. I knew everything. I was I was a god. And till I wasn't. And then, <laughs> but you know, it's, yeah, you, you have to be able to, to work with people to, to be able to sit and be nice and chit chat and find out what's really going on. Yeah, that's true. Well, hey folks, we're going to kind of wrap up a little bit here, but I uh, wanted to mention a few things, just uh, some housekeeping items. First of all, hit that subscribe button because we go live at random times sometimes. <laughs> Um, and sometimes when we don't intend to, uh, be late and things like that, things happen, but, um, Hey, we're, we're busy professionals just like you are. And so sometimes we get kind of mixed up schedule wise. So we do have a way to actually get our calendar right on your calendar. And that is if you go to thrive, it dot thrive dash it.com slash ICS, that will put an iCal calendar right into your calendar. You can get notices on when we're going live, get other events we're doing, anything like that. That's the place we're going to put that. Uh, also, if you are wanting to share this with a friend, you can just share thriveit.com slash YT, and this will bring them directly to the place where they can subscribe as well. And finally, <laughs> we do have a survey out there that we would really love for you to complete to tell us more about yourself and how we can better serve you. Uh, right now, we're talking as 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 of today, the survey that's out there is along the lines of virtual conferences, like we were just talking about, and just trying to figure out the best way to do that. And so, we do need some input from you. So, just go to uh, thrive-it.com slash survey to fill out that survey and that will actually help us a great deal on how we can better serve your needs so yeah and Spend tomorrow i have my uh i have my my cug c presentation on layering uh basically a fundamentals on yeah. lay on layering what layering is the different products and the technology itself really a deep dive um, initially into what is this layering thing? Uh, because I, 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 I think there's a lot of people that have heard oh, the term. Sure. Yeah. And, but they don't really know what it means and what it's doing. So absolutely. We'll do that, and I am going to be as non-biased as I possibly can. Power through it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be fun. And if you show up, stuff. if you show up live to this uh, to this conversation, um, there is a chance you could win a hot new uh, CGC T-shirt like this. This is the 2020 shirt. I'm getting in the way with the microphone, but this <laughs> is the new shirt. So that is something that will be uh, shipped to just a few people that participate and uh, answer three questions. Yeah, three of them. Yep. That'd be awesome. So make sure you do that. Three different so. people. Awesome. Well, hey, folks, thanks for joining us today. And we really do hope that in all these things that you have a overall vision and, a, and, and the knowledge that you can thrive as a person in IT, that you don't have to just take whatever's in front of you as that's what it'll always be. There's always options to improve, always options to figure out your best, best path. And we are passionate about getting that done for you. We've got some really 
really exciting things coming. Uh, Jeff and I are working behind the scenes to figure out some ways to really go in, dive deep with uh, this whole entire community and how we can all bring each other up in a whole new way that hasn't been done before. And right. it is super exciting. So look for that soon. Until next time, this is DJ Eshelman. Jeff Pitch. <laughs> Forget which one to point on oh, the camera. Oh, I did that bad. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for, so much for being here with us. And uh, for all of you on the recording, thanks for watching through this as well. And we hope to see you on the next Thrive.